Hi, I'm Stephen Carson coming at you from St. Louis, Missouri in these United States. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, very quickly, show is supported by generous contributors on Subscribestar. You can find that in the link in the video description. Most folks um, kick in five bucks a month, but it adds up, lets me cover costs of the show, like the pretty thumbnails and various things. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm considering this the start of a new little mini-series, though I'm putting it together in a playlist with a episode I did a long time ago with Mad Merc, uh, Mad Mercenary, on um, the Industrial Revolution of the Middle Ages. So if you look in the video description, you'll see a playlist. The first video is that old episode, and, and then this series will build, up, uh, build out that playlist. Um, which is basically about the history of the Middle Ages. Why is history of the Middle Ages interesting to me? Well, <clears throat> part of it is because uh, lies, you know. I'm reminded of what uh, Murray Rothbard said, um, uh, hatred is my muse. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'd go so far as to say hatred is my muse, but I would say that lies are often a muse for me. Um, and I'm, I'm put in mind of a lie that I remember getting somehow when I was young. Maybe you guys did too. I don't know. Maybe this has been well debunked in popular culture by now. Uh, the myth of the flat earth, which is that um, people in the Middle Ages believed the earth was flat. And uh, Christopher Columbus, for example, was arguing against flat earthers and convincing them that it made sense to try to get to the Indies. Uh, I was trying to get to India, I should say, um, by going... Um, by going east um, across the Atlantic because the earth was round, right? And the people arguing against him were, you know, ignorant, religious, superstitious, uh, dogmatic, terrible people, terrible, ignorant, medieval Christian people, right? Um, so that I remember absorbing that story somehow. Well, it's just a complete modern lie and concoction uh, there's a, actually the Wikipedia article is pretty good on this. Um, I'll share it in the live chat right now for your edification. I re really recommend reading it. Um, it, it. I like historiography, the history of history, so to speak, right? Uh, and and uh, what they point out in the article very briefly, and then I'll, I'll leave you to look at the rest of it, but is that um, the spherical Earth goes back to the ancient Greeks. We'll be getting into that uh, today. Um, uh, and it was um, widespread in the Greek world, and they even had an idea of the circumference of the Earth, which was um, not too far off. Um, and the uh, most Europeans and Middle Eastern scholars espoused Earth's sphericity in the early Middle Ages, 600 to 1000 AD. And then belief in a flat Earth among educated European was almost non-existent from the late Middle Ages onward. Um, so Stephen Jay Gould says, there never was a period of flat earth darkness among scholars, regardless of how the public at large may have conceptualized our planet both then and now. Greek knowledge of sphericity never faded, and all major medieval scholars accepted the earth's roundness as an established fact of cosmology. Um, so how did this happen? Well, historian Jeffrey Burton Russell says the Flat Earth era flourished most between 1870 and 1920, that recently in history. Why was that? Well, it had to do with the ideological setting created by struggles over biological evolution. So it was uh, creationists versus Darwinists, and to slam the creationists, they said, hey, you Christians, you're so ignorant, you believe the Earth was flat, but they were lying, okay? Um, and... Uh, Popularization of the flat earth myth uh, came from John William Draper, Andrew Dixon White, and Washington Irving, who did this, um, was it a play? Anyway, a, a story about, um, fictional story about Columbus that painted that picture of, of his opponents being flat earthers. The truth of the history, actually, by the way, on the, on the Columbus thing, um, do they, uh, here, let me see if they've got it in this article. I think they do. Um, do, do, do. um, yeah, um, yeah, here we go. 
so so the, the the disputed point with Columbus was not the um, shape of the earth, nor the idea that going west would eventually lead to Japan and China, but the ability of European ships to sail that far across open seas. Um, the small ships of the day simply could not carry enough food and water to reach Japan. And that was correct. They were actually, the opponents of Columbus were actually correct in regards to the scientific uh, dispute, which was the size of the earth. Columbus was wrong, and we'll see where he got that from in, in a bit. Um, uh, and they, they just barely reached the Caribbean before the, uh, they were on the edge of starvation when they reached the, the Caribbean, much closer than Japan. So he had a crazily small idea of the size of the earth. And what saved him was that no one, none of them knew about the Americas, <laughs> neither Columbus nor, nor um, the people debating with him. Um, so he just, in a sense, got saved by dumb luck, right? Uh, and, and this story that Columbus was like, you know, a scientific hero or something is just, just wrong. Um, I, he was heroic in, in a sense, right? But, but not in a scientific sense. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> anyway, I, I say all that story as an introduction to this little series on the Middle Ages and science, because I think there's been a lot of uh, lies about um, the Middle Ages not just the flat earth myth, which is fairly recent, but there's some older um, things that have been put forward about the Middle Ages that are just not accurate. Uh, in particular, I, I don't know, I kind of remember getting this vague idea that like, you know, the church was burning scientists or something, you know, like, like it was just this, uh, you know, conflict um, between science and uh, the church and the ignorant medieval Christians were just suppressing science until finally it broke through in the Renaissance and, and threw off the shackles of ignorant medieval Christendom and, and gave us the modern world and all this stuff. It's just bullshit from one end of it to the other. Just terrible. So anyway, the point of this series is to tell the real story. Um, and we're going to go into some detail, but I, I think you'll find it interesting. And as I mentioned um, on Twitter, uh, we'll even learn today, uh, if, if we make it that far, about the origin of the university in Western Europe, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, first of all, um, before I get into this, the um, title of the this episode is Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. Um, and uh, that phrase was used a number of times. Um, some people think of it as a, a Isaac Newton thing. Um, yeah, in fact, that wording, uh, let's see, what Descartes did was a good step. You have added much several ways, and especially in taking the colors of thin plates into philosophical consideration. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, um, and uh, as, as my friend uh, pointed out, some saw that as a sarcastic remark directed at Hooke's appearance. Um, he was uh, a small, small man. Um, anyway. Uh, but um, actually, it goes way back before that. Uh, Bernard of Chartres, um, in 1159, uh, John of Salisbury wrote, Bernard of Chartres used to compare us to dwarfs perched on the shoulders of giants. He pointed out that we see more and farther than our predecessors, not because we have keener vision or greater height, but because we are lifted up and borne aloft on their gigantic stature. Um, the, the point of it um, was uh, that they were building on the work of the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, and uh, you know they were thankful to what they had learned from the ancient Greeks. Notice, though, that um, standing on the shoulders of giants it means they were seeing further than the ancient Greeks. So it was, it was sort of a double-sided, it's a double-sided um, comment here. Uh, you know, uh, humility of saying, we're just dwarfs standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, you know, we're building on these previous discoveries. We, we are grateful and thankful to those who came before us. Uh, that's all there. Good sentiments in my view, um, uh, virtuous sentiments. Uh, but it is also notice we're standing on their shoulders and we are seeing further than they did, right? So we are advancing beyond the ancients. 
by building on them and then taking it further. It's a great little summary, as we'll see, of, of how science developed in the Middle Ages. They did indeed build on the Greeks, and then they went further. Um, that may not sound very exciting. Well, of course they went further. <laughs> no. There's others who absorbed the Greeks and didn't go further. Um, so, so that is actually what makes um, science develop in Western Europe, is, is the going further part. Other people had the Greeks, but they, they didn't really advance beyond them. They just sort of worshipfully read them and said, you know, Aristotle's the greatest thing ever, and he never made any mistakes, and they were static. You know, they didn't didn't uh, go further. Western Europe went further. That is the story of science, and it starts a long, long time ago, well before the Renaissance. Okay, so I am gonna share the book. Why not? Um, this is uh, was recommended by Ed Faser. Uh, uh, Catholic philosopher who I got to know many years ago. Um, and wait a second, I thought I had this all lined up. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and um, uh, this book is called The Foundations of Modern Science in the Middle Ages, The Religious, Institutional, and Intellectual Contexts by Edward Grant. It's an excellent book, and thanks to Mr. Fazer uh, for recommending it. And um, in general, by the way, Phaser is spelled F-E-S-E-R, and I'd recommend him to you. Um, his works, uh, he has uh, a book, for example, on the Thomistic uh, proofs of the existence of God, you know, prime mover and all that stuff, where he explains that, uh, though it is often said that, like, you know, those are ridiculous and we've disproved those proofs or something, they never were disproved, and actually they're very good proofs for the existence of God in, in, in that book. As I, I haven't read it, but as I understand it, Ed goes through those proofs and, and sort of uh, steel mans them and shows, you know, responds to critiques and shows that actually they're, they're pretty good arguments. Um, there, there's this, sometimes there's this presentism where it's like people were dumb in the past and we're smarter than that now, but well, as you'll see in, the, in this history that we learned, that's not always the case. Um, this is a Whig view of history, you know, that everything always goes up. Uh, we're always progressing. We're always uh, brighter than the people before us. Um, but uh, that's that's just, that's not real. <laughs> that's not true. Okay, anyway, to the book. Um, I'm going to be moving along as I usually do. I hope, as usual, the purpose of these things is to give you a good idea but also, hopefully, I'm looking for those people who uh, are like, wait, what's that bit he skipped, <laughs> you know, um, and who want to go deeper. And I'm hoping to inspire you to pick up the book yourself and read it yourself. Uh, so I, I will not feel constrained to cover every last thing in here. Um, OK. <clears throat> uh, right. So between 1902 and 1916, P Pierre Duhem a famous French physicist turned historian, wrote 15 volumes on modern science. What he discovered led him to make the startling claim that the scientific revolution associated with the glorious names of Nicolas Copernicus, Galileo Galilei, Johann, Johannes Kepler, René Descartes, and Isaac Newton was but an extension and elaboration of physical and cosmological ideas formulated in the 14th century, the 1300s primarily by Parisian masters at the University of Paris. Now, I'm not going to go further with his summary here because, um, uh, because uh, we're going to do the, the detailed reading, and I don't need to do more of the preface. Uh, we're going to go through the details of the story. Okay, so <clears throat> first of all, let's talk about um, the Roman Empire, first six centuries of Christianity, I have covered the story of the rise of Christianity, and it definitely overlaps with a number of the points he makes in a speech I gave at an event, and I would recommend that to your attention. I know I recommend it regularly, but I, th I think it's good. Um, and there I'm drawing on the work of Rodney Stark, and I'm dropping that link in there right now. Um, uh, and. Um, uh, Dave Bergeron, I don't know what you want me to link. 
um, tell me what, what, what thing I've mentioned you want me to link and I'm happy to do it. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. In fact, I prefer to give people links to things that I mentioned because I want you to be able to dig deeper if, if you'd like. Uh, anyway, so I gave a speech on the um, called the uh, Vanguard of Christendom, talking about the early church and how it um, went from a very small movement to taking over the Roman Empire basically in a few hundred years, which I thought was impressive, especially given its method methods. Um, we'll see that uh, Islam shows a different path. <laughs> um, Oh, right. Okay. Um, give me just a moment. He's talking about N. Pazer's book. I think I should be able to find it. Yeah, there we go. Five proofs of the existence of God. And sharing that right now. This is Ed Pazer. Excuse me. Okay. Shared that link. Thank you. Yeah. I, 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 I don't mind the reminders. Like I said, I love to share links uh, of anything I talk about. Okay, so so yeah, I talked about the story of Christianity's rise in the Roman Empire. It's uh, a bit different than um, you might think, or I think most of people just don't know much about it. Um, but something very interesting that he emphasizes here that I hadn't thought so much about, um, he emphasized, I think Christianity grew and, and, you know, the way it took over the Roman Empire in a few hundred years, a couple hundred years is amazing. Um, he actually contrasts it to Islam and talks about how Christianity grew slowly, but that there was some upside, shall we say, at least for the story we want to tell here, to the pace of the growth of Christianity in the Roman Empire. Um, so he talks about how uh, Christianity and many other, like, cults, Christianity, as I described in my speech, was a cult in the context of the Roman Empire. Um, that is, a, you know, a new paradigm-shifting religion that, that would overthrow the previous religion, right? Um, it wasn't just like a minor variation. A sect would be a minor variation on, on pagan, you know, Greco-Roman paganism. Christianity was not that. It was very different, and they knew it. And, you know, they could feel, and that's why Christian, Christians were persecuted, they could feel that Christianity was a, a, a strong challenge to the Greco-Roman pagan worldview. Um, but he said what had happened is the sense of comfort that pagans derived from their belief in the traditional Homeric and Roman gods of the state religions uh, was disappearing in, the, in this first couple centuries after Christ. And he mentions a number of the cults that along with Christianity, Gnosticism, Isis, you know, all this sort of Mithras, so, so forth. All this stuff was going on. Um, one of the things the cults uh, tended to have, including Christianity, of course, was belief in a redeemer God who would die in order to bring eternal life after death to his faithful followers. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, why can't I turn? Okay, there we go. Um, uh, yeah, so he talks about the slow pace relative to Islam of the growth of Christianity. Uh, it was not until 392, the end of the 4th century, that Christianity became the exclusive religion supported by the state. After almost four centuries, Christianity was triumphant. Like I said, if that story interests you, watch my speech. Uh, people really like it. <laughs> um, and, and it, there's lessons for, for us uh, who are um, dissidents to the current imperial order. Um, <clears throat> but he contrasts with Islam. He says, where Islam was spread largely by conquest during its first 100 years, Christianity spread slowly, and with the exception of certain periods of persecution, relatively peacefully. And by periods of per persecution, he means Christianity being persecuted, not Christians persecuting others. It was the slow percolation of Christianity that enabled it to adjust to the pagan world around it and thus prepare itself for a role that could not have been envisioned by its early members. This is a quite interesting point I'd never thought about. The, the Christianity um, grew up in a pagan world and learned to, uh, how to well, as we'll see, to, to draw certain things from, from the pagan world. Um, <clears throat> 
The, the momentous adjustment of Christianity to the pagan world around it is manifested by numerous learned Christians whose writings were subsequently influential. To Gregory of Nyssa, Christianity was the sublime philosophy. Yet he, like many other eminent Christians, recognized that pagan philosophy still had a role to play, as did pagan tradition and learning generally. Uh, Christians in this period came to share numerous cultural traditions with their pagan neighbors and fellow citizens. Much of this came by way of padia, a kind of shared civility, which offered ancient, almost proverbial guidance drawn from the history and literature of Greece on serious issues, issues which no notable Christian or polytheist, bishop or layman, could afford to ignore. Um, on courtesy, on the prudent administration of friendship, on the control of anger, on poise and persuasive skill when faced by official violence. Right, so they're, they're drawing things that are generally useful from um, uh, pagan thought. Um, many church fathers, of whom Gregory of Nyssa was one, followed Plato and argued that science could at best give only probable knowledge, not genuine truth. Um, and, and he talks about some other church fathers who were more like hostile to Greek science very, very early. We're talking like first, second century. But as, as early as the end of the second century, so just less than 200 years into the history of the church, and first half of the third century, other Christian apologists came to a quite different conclusion. They argued that Christianity could profitably utilize pagan Greek philosophy and learning. In a momentous move, Clement of Alexandria, who was born around 150, um, and his disciple Origen of Alexandria, born around 185, laid down the basic approach that others would follow. Greek philosophy was neither inherently good nor bad, but was one or the other depending on how it was used by Christians. Although the Greek poets and philosophers had not received direct revelation from God, they did receive natural reason and were thus heading toward truth. Philosophy and secular learning in general could thus be used to prepare the way for Christian wisdom, which was the fruit of revelation. Philosophy and science could be studied as handmaidens to theology, that is, as aids in understanding Holy Scripture. Um, science was thus regarded as a study that was preparatory for the higher disciplines that were concerned with Scripture and theology. In the second half of the fourth century, Basil of Caesarea reinforced the handmaiden idea in a brief treatise to students titled on how to make good use of the study of Greek literature. So this is really important, right? Um, yeah, well, he says it well. The Christians chose to accept pagan learning within limits was within limits was a momentous decision. They might have heeded Tertullian, who asked pointedly, what indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What concord is there between the academy and the church? With the total triumph of Christianity at the end of the 4th century, the church might have reacted against Greek pagan learning in general, and Greek philosophy in particular, finding much in the latter that was unacceptable or perhaps even offensive. They might have launched a major effort to suppress pagan learning as a danger to the church and its doctrines, but they did not. Why not? So this is, you, you just sort of accept that things happened and they, they must have happened that way, but that's not true, right? It, it could have been a jihad. It could have been a Butlerian jihad, so to speak. Uh, once the Christians were not being persecuted anymore, uh, they were on top now, they had control of state, um, the state, um, they could have been like, okay, we're going to, you know, these people who persecuted us, uh, you know, the, the paganism, um, we are going to erase any memory that these people existed. We're going to burn their books. We're going to scratch their names off monuments. These things have been done in the history of the world, right? It's not... It certainly is a path they could have chosen. Um, but this author suggests some reasons why they didn't go that way. Uh, perhaps it was in the slow dissemination of Christianity. After four centuries as members of a distinct religion, Christians had learned to live with Greek secular learning and to utilize it for their own benefit. Their education was heavily infiltrated by Latin and Greek pagan literature and philosophy. Numerous converts to Christianity, the most notable being St. Augustine, had been steeped in pagan learning, which formed a normal part of their societal and cultural milieu. So Christians did find certain aspects of pagan culture and learning unacceptable, but they did not view them as a cancer to be cut out of the Christian body. It was just, eh, we disagree with that, eh, but that's useful, right? Pick and choose, take the best, leave the rest, was, was the philosophy. So the handmaiden theory was obviously a compromise between rejection of traditional pagan learning 
and its full acceptance. Um, and see, this is the part that, because uh, we're, we're taught by uh, anti-Christians, anti-Europeans <laughs> at this point, um, this is the part where you need to appreciate the, the tension. Uh, and Rodney Stark explains this so well in his explanation of why science arose in Western Europe and not anywhere else. This tension between not rejecting it, like we understand that's important because you can't re reject the Greeks, right? That'd be terrible. Um, that, that's been hammered home for us. But what doesn't get emphasized is the other error, falling off the horse on the other side, which is that full acceptance, full blind obedience, you know, worship the ancient Greeks, we'll never understand anything better than they did. Um, that was also not the attitude taken. It was a critical attitude. We can learn from it, but we're going to use our judgment. Right. So important in the rise of science. So by, approach, by approaching secular learning with caution, Christians could utilize Greek philosophy, especially metaphysics, to better understand and explicate Holy Scripture and to cope with the difficulties generated by the assumption of the doctrine of the Trinity and other esoteric dogmas. So they saw it as, hey, this helps us think about things that are important to us as Christians. Um, and, and also, you know, there's astronomy and mathematics, and that's all useful in our daily lives, right? Um, okay, so... <clears throat> um, one of the early things we see where you see the uh, sort of wedding of Christian thought and um, pagan uh, scientific thought or... Uh, let, let me make sure everyone understands the term natural philosophy should be thought of as more or less a synonym with science. Natural philosophy is the term that would have been used until more recently um, in, in, in Christendom to refer to science. It's the philosophy of nat understanding nature, right? Thinking about nature. Um, so um, hexameral literature, I didn't look that word up, but I assume it, it means that it's literature about the beginning of the earth or uh, um, the creation account in Genesis. Um, there are a number of influential church fathers, Saints Basil, Ambrose, and Augustine, for example, who wrote commentaries that proved influence, commentaries on Genesis that proved influential in the Middle Ages. And let me quote at length here about Basil because it'll give you a flavor of how um, quite early, Basil lived in the 300s, so fourth century, how quite early um, thinking about scripture is starting to shade into doing science, right? Thinking about nature in, in, a, in a systematic way. So Basil, who wrote in Greek, presented his commentary in the form of nine homilies, delivered originally as lectures to audiences in a church. In this famous work, Basil sought to praise the glory and power of God and to instill in Christians to, a strong sense of moral purpose. To achieve these ends, he appealed to nature as God's handiwork. In the process, he found it necessary to convey a modicum of contemporary scientific knowledge about the basic structure and composition of the world. For example, in explaining the words, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, Basil was compelled to consider a host of topics, whether creation was simultaneous or over time, in time, took time, right? Whether the heavens were created before the earth, the nature of the heavenly substance, the meaning of the firmament, the meaning of the waters above and below that firmament, clouds, vapors, and the four elements, the location and shape of the world, the production of vegetation on the earth, the creation of the planets and stars, the creation of crawling creatures, birds, and sea life. Thus, Basil confronted the question, how does the earth remain immobile at the center of the world? On what does it rest? Perhaps drawing on Aristotle, Basil considered a number of possible answers. The earth rests on air or on water, or on something heavy. Rejecting these options, for example, if a heavier object supported the earth, one would then have to ask what held up the heavier object, and so on, Basil concluded that the earth has no reason to move because it lies in the middle of everything. That might sound silly to you, but it, it, he rejected a lot of bad ideas, right, uh, in embracing that. He never tired of emphasizing the marvelous design that God embedded in nature. Uh, I'd like to continue. Uh, I, I hope you're getting it right, uh, talking about, you know, the the clouds, vapors, the four elements. I mean, he, 
he's doing a sort of science or scientific thinking uh, in some form, right? Basil frequently mixed his descriptions of natural phenomena and design, especially of the behavior of animals and plants, with morality. As he put it, everything in existence is the work of providence, and nothing is bereft of the care owed to it. If you observe carefully the members even of the animals, you will find that the Creator has added nothing superfluous, and that he has not omitted anything necessary. He drew lessons from the migration of fish, the stealth of the octopus, the function of the elephant's trunk, the behavior of dogs tracking wild animals, and the existence of both poisonous and edible plants all play their designated role in nature, even poisonous plants. For as Basil argued, there is no one plant without worth, not one without use. Either it provides food for some animal, or has been sought out for us by the medical profession for the relief of certain diseases. Thus did Basil respond to those who wondered why God would create poisonous plants capable of killing humans. Um, I mean, already here we see him advanced beyond, you know, I mean, admittedly, they were sort of making a joke, right? But Monty Python um, played off uh, all things good and beautiful. It's a, it's a hymn. I don't know that well. Um, and uh, in one of their movies, and they, they had them in the church singing all things ugly and poisonous or something. I, I'm sorry. I forget it. I, I should have had it in my head. But um, uh you know, and they're basically like, in so many words, saying, look, there's poisonous and ugly things in the world, and therefore God is bad, or God didn't create things, or I don't know. Um, and uh, uh, already here you see Basil in the fourth century is is thinking much more carefully and fruitfully about the world. Um, okay, so let's see, what else did I want to highlight from here? Um Ah, okay. So <clears throat> he he talks about the relationship between early Christianity, uh, or I'm sorry, the relationship between Christian church and secular state, you know, that they never, um, we never got a uh, theocracy, you know, we never got a God emperor in the West, in Europe. Um, and, and this is really important. And, and he says, and he goes through that, um, and then he explains why. So why are the relationships between early Christianity and Greek science and philosophy, on the one hand, and between the Christian church and the secular state, on the other hand, relevant to the history of science? Because as we shall see, the separation of church and state, at least in principle, and more significantly, the Christian accommodation with Greek science and philosophy, were instrumental conditions that facilitated the widespread, intensive study of natural philosophy during the late Middle Ages. As a consequence of the emergence of natural philosophy within the unique university system of the Latin Middle Ages, the revolutionary, revolutionary developments in science of the 16th and 17th centuries were made possible. We may better appreciate the force of these claims by comparison of Western Europe developments, Western European developments with developments in two major contemporary civilizations, Islam and the Byzantine Empire. Um, the differences are striking and will be in the final chapter. So we're not going to get to that today, but I look forward to that because that's something Rodney Stark really drove home for me, that um, just having access to the ancient Greeks was not enough because the Byzantines had the ancient Greeks and the Saracens, you know, the Muslim empire had the ancient Greeks and they did not develop science. Um, so... <clears throat> Um, okay, so as you probably are aware, um, the language of learning in the Roman Empire was Greek, uh, and in the Eastern Roman Empire it was just the language. Um, but even in the Western Roman Empire, if you wanted to get into philosophy or science, natural philosophy or whatever, you would learn Greek. Um, and so uh, the Romans did not tend to be very abstract. They were very pragmatic people. <laughs> so how did science fare within the Roman Empire? Um, and he says that um, some of the greatest scientific works of the ancient world were written in this period of the Roman Empire in the Greek language and in the eastern half of the empire. A few of these works exerted a profound influence on the later course of med medieval science and well beyond into the Renaissance, as we'll see. So what is he talking about here? Um, the first century AD saw the significant works of Hero of Alexandria, who wrote on pneumatics, mechanics, optics, and mathematics. 
Nicomachus on Pythagorean arithmetic, Theodosius and Menelaus, who both wrote on spherical geometry. Menelaus's spherics is especially important for the treatment of spherical triangles and trigonometry. The greatest works in astronomy and medicine were written in the second century. Claudius Ptolemy, Ptolemy wrote the mathematical syntaxis or Almagest, as it was called by the Arabs, the greatest treatise in the history of astronomy until the time of Copernicus in the 16th century. Ptolemy's scientific genius was not confined to astronomy. He also wrote technical works in optics, geography, and stereographic projection. He even produced the greatest of all astrological works, the Tetrabiblos. Um, in the medical and biological sciences, Galen of Pergamum produced about 150 works embracing both theory and practice, which formed the basis of medical theory and study until the 16th and 17th centuries. Even in the third century, significant contributions were made in mathematics by Diophantus and algebra and later by Pappus, who not only wrote commentaries on the great mathematical works of Greek antiquity, but also in his mathematical collection showed originality and understanding of a high order. The Greek world of late antiquity also contributed powerfully to natural philosophy, largely by way of commentaries on the works of Aristotle, and this will be very important, um, the, these commentaries. Um, so the achievements of the first six centuries of the Christian era were typical of the manner in which Greek science and natural philosophy had developed and advanced, always the product of a small number of gifted scholars concentrated in a few centers, Greek science was a fragile enterprise, able to advance and preserve itself just so long as the intellectual environment was favorable or at least not overtly antagonistic. Greek science at its traditional best in the Roman Empire was but a continuation of the progress already made in the physical and biological sciences of classical Greece and the Hellenistic world when the works of Plato, Aristotle, Hippocrates, Eudoxus, Euclid, Archimedes, Apollonius of Perga, Hipparchus, the Theophas, Theophrastus, Hierophilus, and Erastostratus established the highest levels of achieve, achievement. Um, right, so yeah, so I said the Romans were kind of practical people, right? Um, the Romans were awed by Greek intellectual accomplishments but they had little interest in theoretical and abstract science. So they're like, wow, that's really cool that we're not really into it. It's not our thing, you know? So when, when fashion dictated that cultured Romans become acquainted with the results of Greek science, they used the handbook method, which was um, uh, Greek and Latin handbooks, which summarized, sometimes not very well, the scientific thinking in, in the great Greek thinkers like Aristotle. Um, so Romans who knew Greek consulted the Greek handbooks directly, but the great majority of Romans absorbed their knowledge through Latin translations or summaries. And then Latin authors began compiling their own handbooks on science. And, and uh, this is called the Latin encyclopedic tradition. Understand here that they, they were not, um, the Latins were not really um, advancing things. They were just compiling and sometimes not even doing a great job of translation and stuff. Um, it, it was, uh, as, well, as he'll say, it was popular science. So um, the Latin encyclopedic tradition began in the first century. Um, its two most significant early representatives were Seneca and Pliny, Pliny the Elder. In natural questions, Seneca concerned himself largely with geography and meteoro meteoro meteorological phenomena. For example, rainbows, halos, meteors, thunder, lightning after the manner of Aristotle's meteorology. He drew heavily upon Aristotle, Posidonius, perhaps his major authority, Theophrastus, and other Greek sources. Because Seneca frequently drew morals from natural phenomena, his book was popular with Christians. He also transmitted to the Middle Ages an estimate of the size of the earth that was small enough to encourage men like Columbus and others to think that the oceans were sufficiently narrow to be readily navigable. So that's where that crazy idea that the earth was small enough that Columbus could just whip whip over to Japan in his small boats um, with very uh, limited supplies. Um, he was he was looking at Seneca on that. So yeah, like I said, you know the, the the encyclopedists were not really scientists; they were just throwing stuff together. Um, so between the fourth and eighth centuries. Encyclopedic authors produced a series of Latin works that were to have significant influence throughout the Middle Ages, especially prior to 1200. And he goes in some detail there. 
Um, okay, need this for context, the seven liberal arts. Um, they embraced uh, the seven liberal, seven liberal arts embraced both verbal and mathematical disciplines. The former, the verbal, known as the trivium, included grammar, rhetoric, and logic. Um, and our friend academic agent, right, has a uh, course on each of those, which he sells as a bundle called the trivium, right? And then the latter, the quadrivium, encompassed the four disciplines of arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music, okay? All of these disciplines took form in classical Greece during the 5th and 4th centuries BC, when they were first conceived as liberal arts suitable for teaching to free young men. But the number of disciplines varied, and it, that canonical number of seven uh, was established by the Latin encyclopedists, and they coined those terms trivium and quadrivium. So they sort of um, systematized it, right? Uh, they shaped the seven liberal, liberal arts into the form they would have in the later Middle Ages. Um, Cassiodorus urged that the seven liberal, art, liberal arts be incorporated into a Christian education. And by the end of the 7th century, so the 600s, the seven liberal arts were considered to be the basis of a proper education. So if there was such a thing as a core of scientific learning going into the early Middle Ages, it was embedded in the quadrivium. The four mathematical sciences that comprised it, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, music, were given their final condensed form by the Latin encyclopedists. So important to have that as background about the seven liberal arts, the trivium, the quadrivium. Um, so they served, those seven liberal arts served as an ideal core of education in the cathedral schools of the 11th and 12th centuries. And this is really where the real story begins for us um, <clears throat> about a thousand years ago. And their study intensified in the 12th century, even as new intellectual riches began to enter Europe from the Islamic world. Uh, so the Latin encyclopedists supplied the early Middle Ages with most of what its scholars would know of science and natural philosophy, their information was largely derived from the Greek and Latin handbook traditions. Um, but there are problems with that. Uh, too often, the encyclopedists failed to comprehend the material they read. Nevertheless, they copied it or paraphrased it in their own treatises. Um, but despite their failings, the encyclopedists performed a vital service. Um, without their contributions, even the meager knowledge of the world that they provided would have been absent. So the encyclopedists provided late ancient and early medieval society with what has been characterized as popular science. And he says, but <laughs> we have to distinguish popular science as it was in this early medieval period with popular science today. He says, today we also have popular science ranging in quality from poor to excellent. A critical difference between our society and that of the Roman West is that the experimental and theoretical science on which our popular science is based was absent from Roman science during late antiquity in the early Middle Ages. Popular science in the Roman West was nearly coextensive with the whole of science. So we are all very aware that popular science is, is giving us a little teaser of a deeper amount of knowledge, right? But the, the handbooks that they would study in you know late ancient, early medieval period was like all they had. That was all they knew, okay? Popular science was science. So he says, there is no denying that a scientific dark age had descended upon Western Europe. That is, the ancients had been making advances, but there was a period there where, you know, they were keeping some of the knowledge alive, but they were not advancing, right? All right, so that's all preparatory to the real story here. Um, Let's see, just looking at comments. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so that's all preparatory to really where our story begins, which is with um, the age of translation. So that's why I called this episode Standing on the Shoulders of Giants, because the story of modern science begins with um, um, getting a big injection of ancient science into uh the Latin speaking part of Europe, you know, Western Europe. Um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, so by AD 500, knowledge of, of uh, Greek 
had become rare and knowledge of the exact sciences even rarer. Um, and there was uh, economic deterioration during this period, right? Um, yeah, but, but then really the turnaround came about a thousand years ago with um, barbarian invasions ending by the 11th century. Uh, the Vikings were the last. And you started to see really the rise of a new Europe. Now, this is where a um, something I've done. Did I already share this? Oh, right. Okay. Um, it, it's in the um, playlist in the video description, but I want to. Uh, oops. Ah. Give me a sec. Okay, yeah, I want to point you to um, this old episode that we did. Um, it's called Medieval Manufacturing. I'll share a link with that right now. And uh, this tells an important part of the story, which he hints at here um, in, in, in bits and pieces. But um, I cover it more thoroughly in that episode, which I'm very proud of. Um, uh, because basically what happened is that about a thousand years ago, even earlier, you had um, effectively an industrial revolution in the Middle Ages, one that's not talked about because of everything I said at the beginning of this episode, that, um, you know, there's a lot of lies and just forgetting about the, um, the early Middle Ages. Um, and so this set uh, the stage for um, Europe to be in a position to uh, carry the scientific tradition, uh, re relearn the scientific tradition through these translations, as we'll go through in detail, and, and then carry it forward, right? Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about what was happening politically and, and materially uh, to set the stage for, for being able to progress, right? It's, it's a Maslow's hierarchy of needs story, right? Um, certain things had to be in place before people were going to be able to spend time on a luxury item like scientific speculation, right? In a deep way. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so here's, here's that uh, quote I used for the title. If they envisioned an extension of the horizons of knowledge, it was only because, as Bernard of Chartres expressed it, they were privileged to stand upon the shoulders of the learned giants of antiquity, a sentiment repeated often through the centuries and even found in a letter by Isaac Newton. Um, so, <clears throat> but the works of those giants had been either unavailable or are known only in fragments. Uh, they had heard about treatises that existed in, in either Greek or had been translated from Greek to Arabic, but they were known in the West only by title, or they didn't even know about them at all. But Western scholars started to get curious about this. And so scholars of the Western world acted to acquire the scientific heritage of the past. Um, now, as an engineer, I really appreciate the, the attitude here. Uh, let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's learn from what came before first, and, uh, and then we'll build on that, right? But let, let's start by just seeing what's out there, right? So they began to translate Greek treatises from Arabic and Greek into Latin. Um, they wanted to present the treasures of the East to the West and thus relieve the poverty of the Latins. And uh, I, I like Latin, so I'll be dropping some Latin phrases in. Latinorum penuria, the, the poverty of the Latins in so many fields. Their translations constitute one of the true turning points in the history of Western science and natural philosophy. And this began, like I said, a thousand years ago, already in the middle of the 10th century, more than a thousand years ago, translations from Arabic to Latin were made in northern Spain. Um, these first translations were largely concerned with geometry and astronomical instruments. Um, and then uh, it continued in the 11th century, Hermann of Reichenau, um, in, the, in the early 1000, 1000s, 1013 to 1054 is when he lived. Um, he was uh, translating information about the Arabic astrolabe. Uh, translations of medical treatises of Greek and Arabic authors was made from Arabic to Latin by Constantine the African. Um, 
the translating activity that revolutionized Western scientific thought and determined its course for centuries to come occurred in the 12th century. So the 1100s uh, is really the key turning point. Uh, he says to a lesser extent in the 13th, but really it's the 1100s, right? <coughs> Between 1125 and 1200, a veritable flood of translations into Latin made a significant part of Greek and Arabic science available, with more to come in the 13th century. So very exciting time here. Um, what set the stage for it? Well, <laughs> political events. The Great Age of Translation was preceded by the rollback of the Muslims in Spain and their defeat in Sicily during the 11th century. So the, the Reconquista, Reconquista, right? With the fall of Toledo in 1085 and the capture of Sicily in 1091, a now reinvigorated Western Europe came into possession of significant centers of Arabic learning. So there's, there's two things going on here. There's um, uh, peace, you know, winning the war <laughs> and driving the Muslims off of the European continent or that part of the European continent. Um, driving them out of Western Europe completely. Uh, and in addition to that, they're finding libraries that have been left behind and translating them. So scholars from all came from all parts of Europe to join with native-born Spaniards, whether Christian, Jew, or Muslim, to engage in the grand enterprise of converting technical science and natural philosophy from the Arabic language into Latin, a language that had hitherto been largely innocent of such matters, except for those handbooks, right? Um, and this was a very international effort. Here's the names of some of the most significant translators. Plato of Tivoli, Gerard of Cremona, Adelard of Bath, Robert of Chester, Herman of Corinthia, Dominicus Gundicellinus, Peter Alfonso, Savasorda, and John of Seville, in the early 13th century came Alfred Sereschel, or Alfred the Englishman, <laughs> Michael Scott, and Herman the German. <laughs> um, so uh, scholars from all over are like, hot diggity, we got, some, we got some very important stuff here, we just need to get it into Latin, and then we can really absorb it as a culture, right? The translations of the 12th and 13th centuries were overwhelmingly of scientific and philosophical works. The humanities and belles lettres belle were scarcely represented. Um, so this was really uh, natural philosophy. It was really science that they were in particular translating, right? Um, someone to mention in particular is Gerard of Cremona. Translations by Gerard of Cremona alone drastically altered the course of Western science. And given how important his contribution is, I'm going to just share a little bit at length here. After absorbing all that was available to the Latins, Gerard went to Toledo to find Ptolemy's Almagest, which could not be found among the Latins. There, in Toledo, seeing the abundance of books in Arabic on every subject and regretting the poverty of the Latins in these things, he learned the Arabic language in order to be able to translate. To the end of his life, Gerard continued to transmit to the Latin world, as if to his own beloved heir, whatever books he thought finest in many subjects as accurately and plainly as he could. So not only did Gerard translate the Almagest, but he also translated at least 70 other treatises. Among these were the basic physical works of Aristotle, physics on the heavens and world, on generation and corruption, and meteorology books one to three as well as Aristotle's Posterior Analytics, the major treatise for discussion of scientific method. Girard also translated numerous mathematical works, including Euclid's Elements, the Algebra of Al-Khwarizmi, and the Geometry of the Three Brothers, which contains significant and subsequently influential Archimedean mathematical techniques. In addition to other astronomical, astrological, alchemical, and statical works, Girard translated a large number of medical treatises, including many by Galen, as well as the Canon of Medicine of Avicenna and the Lib Li Liber Continens, that is the Book of Divisions of Al-Razi. These works form the core of medieval medical studies. So hugely important what happened here. Um, so just as Girard of Cremona towered above all other translators from Arabic to Latin, so William of Morbeke, 
not sure how to say that name, uh, who lived 1215 to 1286, a Flemish Dominican, was supreme over all translators from Greek to Latin. So he went directly from Greek. Encouraged by his friend, St. Thomas Aquinas, you might have heard of him, who had complained of the inadequacy of the translations of Aristotle's works from Arabic, Morbaki completed new translations from Greek manuscripts of almost all of Aristotle's works, except the prior and posterior analytics. To these, he added translations of commentaries on Aristotle's works by some of the most important Greek commentators of late antiquity, such as Alexander of Aphrodisius, John Philoponus, Simplicius, and Themistius. In 1269, he translated all but a few of the numerous works of Archimedes, along with important Greek commentaries. Um, Morbaki made at least 49 translations ranging, ranging over theology, science, and philosophy. So <clears throat> Aristotle's works, it, it's not just Aristotle, right? But Aristotle in particular is really key. <laughs> of the giants, he's the giantist, I guess. Um, uh, of the translations of Aristotle's works, those made directly from Greek were far more nu numerous than those made from Arabic, which was great because, you know, you're going from language to language, you're losing something each time. So going back to the original Greek was, was good. Primary translators of Aristotle's works from the Greek were Boethius in the early 6th century, James of Venice, Henricus Aristippus, and Ioannis, a little-known figure in the 12th century, Robert Grosstest and William of Merbaki in the 13th century, the latter undoubtedly the greatest of all translators from Greek into Latin. Okay, so why am I talking about all this translation? It's because um, this is really what kicks things off, uh, right? It's, it's um, science or natural philosophy is in a kind of a holding pattern for some hundreds of years in the late, uh, you know, in that transition from the ancient world to the um, early medieval world you know, 500 to 1,000, something like that, right? Um, and then you get to the 1100s, and it really goes. So um, he says, translations on a grand scale awaited the 12th century in Spain, largely between 1140 and 1160. Um, it was not likely that translations could have occurred earlier than, than the 12th century because the texts were not readily available and the Christian-Muslim conflicts in Spain and Sicily were too intense until the late 11th century. Um, so, you know, the, the, the situation, political situation, had to change. Um, okay, so the introduction of the works of Aristotle into the Latin language and the subsequent dissemination and assimilation of these works transformed the intellectual life of Western Europe. But Aristotle's influence did not depend solely on his own works. To assess the enormous impact of Aristotle, we must consider the commentaries on his works that were composed by Greeks in late antiquity and by Arabs during the 9th to 12th centuries. Um, the totality of this body of literature, the inheritance and the additions thereto, is what we today call Aristotelianism. So have to be careful, if you hear Aristotelianism, don't just think the works of Aristotle. It's the works of Aristotle with people thinking about the works of Aristotle, commenting, trying to explain stuff that seems unclear, trying to reconcile um, aspects that are not in harmony with each other, trying to fill in gaps that Aristotle left, right? So yes, they're starting with Aristotle, but they're not stopping with Aristotle. They're carrying it forward as a tradition of thought. Um, so this term, Aristotelianism, which was never used in the Middle Ages, by the way, that's a modern term, but it does characterize the major components of intellectual life from the 12th century to the 15th, which is he calls the Middle Ages proper, right? 1100s to 1400s, and even beyond to the end of the 17th century. So Aristotelianism is very important. And if you listen to Ed Fazer, who recommended this book, he would say that Aristotelianism is, that Aristotelianism is still important right now, <laughs> um, certainly in philosophy. And, and, and we, we lose a lot by not building on, on all the great thinking that was done from Aristotle to the Greek commentators to um, all the medieval philosophers and scholars who continue to wrestle, develop, uh, correct the, this tradition of thought. Um, so through commentaries on the works of Aristotle, the Greek world of late antiquity contributed significantly to natural philosophy. 
working between AD 200 and 600, Greek commentators left behind numerous treatises, the extent part of which comprises approximately 15,000 15, pages of Greek text in the edition known as the Ancient Greek Commentaries on Aristotle. Um, so it's, it's, they're translating Aristotle, they're translating commentaries on Aristotle, Greek commentaries. Um, of course, there were contributions made by Islamic commentators who were translating and trying to understand what this stuff meant. Um, so when Aristotle's works were translated from Greek or even Syriac to Arabic during the 9th and 10th centuries, it was not long before Islamic scholars studied these works and wrote commentaries on them. Among Muslim scholars who wrote on Aristotle in Arabic and who had works translated into, into Latin, the most important were Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Avicenna, Al-Ghazali, and Averroes seems to be particularly important. Of this group, Avicenna, Al-Ghazali, and Averroes had the greatest impact on Aristotelian natural philosophy in the West. The most influential Jewish scholar in Islam to contribute to European scholarship was Moses Maimonides, 1135 to 1204, who wrote in Arabic. Um, so Europe is drawing on the Greeks, on Arabic scholars who are trying to understand the Greeks, right? And even on um, a Jewish scholar who, who's writing in Arabic. Um, it is one of history's ironies, by the way, by the way that Averroes' Arabic works were virtually ignored by Arabic-speaking peoples in Islamic countries, but that many of these same works exerted a great influence in Christendom by way of Latin translations. Thus far, some 38 Arabic commentaries by Averroes on the works of Aristotle have been identified. This large number results from the fact that Averroes wrote at least two and often three different kinds of commentaries on any given Aristotelian treatise. Um, on Aristotle's physics, for example, he wrote an epitome, or brief summary, a middle commentary, or paraphrase of the text, and a long commentary, which was a detailed sequential discussion of the successive sections of the entire text. So if you go through it more than once, right, um, going deeper each time. Okay, skipping the pseudo-Aristotelian works. These were attributed to Aristotle, but not actually authored by him. Um, so, how was all this received? Again, this brings us back to that question. Would Christendom, Western Christendom, uh, reject the Greeks, right? How would they... Think of what would they think of all these pagan texts? Um, you could easily see them saying, "Hey, these guys were not Christians. Um, you know, they're from the devil or something. Just you can't learn anything from them." Um, here's what happened: the texts of Aristotle were difficult, and the translations not always clear, occasionally prompting charges of obscurity. So the commentaries of Avicenna and Averroes were enthusiastically welcomed as guides for the interpretation of Aristotle's demanding texts. So they're like, hey, you can help us understand this? Great. Um, by the middle of the 13th century, manuscripts of Aristotle's work turn up in large numbers. And he asks, how was this large body of pagan science and natural philosophy received? How did Christians respond to a body of literature with which they were completely unfamiliar and which had potential problems for the faith? Um, well, they had been exposed to pagan thought, as he mentioned earlier, almost from the moment that the Christian religion was disseminated beyond the Holy Land. Um, Latin authors in the West, such as Augustine, Ambrose, the Latin encyclopedists, were familiar with pagan ideas. And so... Um, the Latin translations of Greco-Arabic science in the 12th and 13th centuries may be viewed as a second and much more extensive influx of pagan thought to the Christians of Western Europe. That is, we sometimes are given this picture that this insular, um, ignorant, uh, superstitious, medieval Christian world um, that finally is enlightened when it's exposed to Greek thought. Well, they, they had already had pagan thought integrated, as we've discussed, right? And, and so really what we're getting with this influx of um, Aristotelian texts is uh, uh, another wave of pagan thought being absorbed. So in a way, this is, there's no big deal. Um, um, so al although the science and natural philosophy of the second wave of pagan thought caused some friction between faith and reason, 
Christian natural philosophers, many of whom were theologians, were delighted to receive them. With Aristotle's logic and natural philosophy at its centerpiece, the new learning furnished the curriculum of the newly emerging universities, which formed one of the most endearing institutional legacies from the Middle Ages. Um, so I think, not going to try to do it all today, I think I'm going to cover this one more chapter on the medieval university, which introduces the institution of the university, uh, which again, like coincidence, I'm sure, like science, is unique not just to not just to Christian Europe, but to Western Christian Europe, surprisingly. Um, or its origin is in Western Christian Europe. So the universities emerged as had emerged as a result of the transformation of society and intellectual life that had occurred in Western Europe by the 12th century. During the late 11th and 12th centuries, political conditions improved dramatically, due in no small measure to French-speaking feudal lords who brought reasonably stable governments to Normandy, England, Italy, Sicily, Spain, and Portugal. The vigor of a revitalized Europe is also evidenced by the reconquest of Spain, which was well underway by the end of the 11th century. So um, watch my show about the Industrial Revolution of the Middle Ages to get more background on this, but very briefly, uh, some economics here, standard of living, economic history, standard of living rose for all segments of society, the advent of the heavy plow to which the horse was now harnessed instead of the ox was key. Um, they came up with the nailed horseshoe and the collar harness, which together made horses far more effective agricultural engines than oxen. Um, the three field system, we probably all heard about that, which allowed for a major increase in food production. Uh, a new crop rotation approach. Um, this made possible an expansion of cities and towns, and Europeans began to colonize previously unpopulated or underpopulated lands as they drove eastward against the Slavs, as the Germans did in their movement beyond the Elbe River. In the Low Countries, they began to reclaim land from the sea, right, in the Netherlands. Um, Europeans were on the move and significant migrations occurred. Many of the new towns were populated by free men, often former serfs. So by the end of the 12th century, notice I highlighted this in an extra special color. By the end of the 12th century, the level of commerce and manufacturing in Europe was probably greater than it had been at the height of the Roman Empire. Between the 9th and 13th centuries, Europe was transformed. A money economy had come into being. So we put this huge emphasis on the Industrial Revolution, which is really quite recent, the 1700s, um, particularly in England, right? Um, but here we are back uh, in, in um, well, as I discuss in this, in this show, you see mechanization beginning in the 900s, in the thousands, in the 1100s, in the 1200s, significant mechanization, capturing of the um, energy of wind and wave and so forth to uh, um, become more productive, you know, to, to have mechanical energy to be used for all kinds of things, you know, processing food and, and, so, and, and many other things. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, we're not given the right background to appreciate that, you know, when Europe started the age of exploration and all that, this didn't come from nowhere. I mean, Europe had really, for hundreds of years prior to the age of exploration, Europe had had massive advances in economic productivity, uh, as well as, as we're focusing here, um, uh, science, right? <clears throat> um, you might be hearing a tornado warning. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, increasingly, urban populations sought as much self-government as they could get struggled to free themselves from taxes imposed by hereditary nobles. Um, the city was a, a very special new development um, where having um, a citizenship of a city gave you protection. Uh, cities became a powerful force in the economic, political, religious, and cultural life of the European continent. Um, the universities of Europe were urban creations. That's part of the importance of doing that brief capsule economic history of, of 
medieval Europe here, right, is that um, all these developments resulted in um, the growth of urban areas, and that gave us universities. And of course, universities are key to the development of science. Um, from the earliest societies of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, numerous diverse urban civilizations had come and gone, but none had produced anything comparable to the universities of Europe. Indeed, universities are hardly essential for a civilization to reach a lofty state of intellectual achievement. And he talks about any, anywhere there's reading and writing, um, you can preserve and transmit a written record and you can build knowledge. And, and so there were great intellectual heights in the medieval civilizations of Islam and China, right? Uh, but but the, the Latin West did it different. <laughs> Um, so although the Latin West derived its science and natural philosophy from the Greeks and Arabs, the university was an independent invention that grew from conditions peculiar to the West in the 12th century. In particular, as you probably heard, there were these guilds or corporations, trade and craft guilds. Uh, they'd organize themselves for protection into these um, things. And medieval lawyers frequently called these organizations by the name universitas. Okay, you know, like university, right? Universitas, which means totality or whole. And that signified that the guild in question represented all the rightful practitioners of that trade or craft. So maybe their names would be Universitas, Universitas de, uh, I don't know the name of a trade in Latin, you know, some trade, you know, uh, blacksmiths or whatever. The, the, the whole of the blacksmiths would be the guild, right? Um, so teaching masters and students formed a vital part of 12th century society. They established important schools in various cathedrals, as mentioned in the comment here, cathedral schools of Western Europe, especially at Paris, Chartres, Orleans. And, um, but operating individually, the masters and students were no match for the municipal, state, and church authorities with whom they had to negotiate teaching conditions. So they looked to the trades, tradesmen and craftsmen and they use that universitas, uni, universitas model on which to base their own organization. By the end of the 12th century, there were already de facto organizations of masters, students, or both known as univer universities. For example, there'd be Universitas Magistrorum, University of Masters, uh, Universitas Scholarium, University of Students, right? So a guild of masters, a guild of students. Eventually, the term Universitas by itself was sufficient to identify an educational institution. So that's how we went from guild, a guild model, to a, a guild term, to just thinking of universities as we do now to refer to an educational institution. Um, and the latter, the educational institutions retain that term permanently, universitas, probably because they outlast, outlasted all the medieval guilds, which didn't really continue into modern times in a significant way. Um, now, the term that they actually, the, the actual term back then that corresponds to what we now call university is, is studium generale, uh, general studies, right? Um, so every master and student was a member not only of his own individual university or corporation, but also of the studium generale. And that is obviously the term that is really equivalent to our modern term university. Um, but towards the end of the Middle Ages, university replaced studium generale and became the term as we know it today. And so that's what we'll use. So it's a little anachronistic to call it university. They wouldn't have called it a university back then. They would have called it studium generale, but you get the idea. Um, so the various medieval guild associations received important monopolistic privileges, and that was true of universities as well. They received special treatment from church and secular authorities who sought to encourage their growth. Each faculty was given jurisdiction over their own internal affairs. They had the legal right to negotiate on a wide range of problems with external authorities. Members of the universitas recorded certain crucial rights, the most important of which was clerical status. How did they pull this off? Um, Although most masters and students were neither ordained nor in religious orders, clerical status conferred upon them the rights of clergy. To attack a student or master who is traveling was the same as attacking a priest and was subject to severe penalties. Um, 
it, it, the clerical status allowed students who were arrested by civil authorities to demand trial in ecclesiastical courts, which were usually more lenient than civil courts. So that was valuable. Um, wait a second, being loudness here. Um, and in, in, in addition to these individual privileges, an important corporate right allowed the universities to suspend lectures and even to depart from their respective cities when they felt their rights had been violated. So they had the right to up sticks and say, you, you guys aren't treating us right, you know, and we'll take our we'll take our uh, institution and everything is, you know, the, the economic benefits, I guess, of whatever uh, of it elsewhere. Uh, so this was a significant economic weapon against the cities in which universities were located. <clears throat> so such privileges made the university a powerful institution and enabled it to exercise considerable influence in medieval society. So by 1200. 1200. This is 824 years ago, right? Universities were flourishing in Bologna, Paris, and Oxford, having probably emerged in that order. First Bologna, then Paris, then Oxford. Probably butchering the Italian there, Italian city name. Um, the emergence of universities was intimately associated with the new world. We're having tornado warnings all day today. Um, uh, okay, wait a second. I think it's going to keep bugging me until I make sure I acknowledge it here. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay, sorry about that. In the Midwest with the tornadoes. Um, so the emergence of universities was intimately associated with the new learning that had been translated into Latin during the course of the 12th century, right? So you've got the big wave of translations in the 1100s and the, ri the rise of the original universities all happening at the same time. So the university was the institutional means by which Western Europe organized, absorbed, and expanded the great volume of new knowledge, the instrument through which it molded and disseminated a common intellectual heritage for generations to come. So there was an institutional, they, they didn't just bring back some of this Greek learning with translation, right? they had an institutional structure um, to plug it into, to carry it forward, to um, build, you know, to, to absorb what was learned, to teach it to students, and to build on it. Uh, by 1500, 300 years later, approximately 70 more universities had been created. Um, so from 1200 to 1500, three centuries of cultural and intellectual history shaped the university into a form that has persisted to the present day. So we really get the modern university uh, that far back. Um, now, this was not a small thing. For the whole of Europe, scholars estimate that approximately 750,000 students matriculated at universities between 1350 and 1500. 750,000 students. That's heading towards 1 million students. So this was a huge enterprise, uh, a huge aspect of what was going on in Europe. Um, by the end of the Middle Ages, nearly, again, remember the populations were much smaller back then. So that absolute number doesn't give us the, um, the relative percentage of, of uh, people who were uh, in, involved with university life. Because, uh, you know, cities, a, a big city back then had 20,000 people or something. Um, by the end of the Middle Ages, nearly every principal state in Europe included a university founded either by a pope or a secular ruler. In retrospect, it is evident that no institution produced in the European Middle Ages has proven more permanent than the university. Um, <clears throat> let's see, a few more things about the university and then we'll wrap up, see if there's any questions. Um, a student's attendance at a university, even for a short period of time, even without an acquisition of a degree, was viewed favorably by society in, in, the, in the Middle Ages and was considered helpful in shaping the student's career. Um, one of the requirements uh, for a student was that you had to attach yourself to a master, and so it's students associated with the same master formed a natural group. Um, and there was... Uh, you know, duties that the student had to the master and duties that the master had toward the student. Let's see, what else I want to highlight? Skipping around a bit here. Um, ah, 
Yeah, so <clears throat> very early on, they developed various ways of interacting with uh, learning and so forth. And one of them, uh, a very important category, the most important category of scholastic literature was something called the questions format. And this genre became almost synonymous with the notion of scholastic method uh, because it utilized the basic form of a scholastic disputation. So they had these live disputations. This was part of learning, part of um, being accepted as having mastered a subject, is that you would be able to um, uh, have hard questions presented, argue various sides of it, and then if you were really ready to go to the next level, determine the question. Um, that is, synthesize the various arguments into a definitive answer to the problem, right? So it was an, uh, originally an oral, uh, an oral exam. We still do oral exams, right, for PhDs and such. Um, it was an oral exam uh, and uh, that the, sort of the community participated in. And that became a basis for these questions documents where they would write down what these disputations, you know, here's these various questions, here's various um, uh, proposals for answers to it. Now here's me synthesizing all of it into a sort of a, an authoritative answer to the question, right? Um, and of course, what we're seeing here is, I, I think, I don't know that he, he draws it, I don't know that he spells it out in the book, but uh, you know, it's, we're seeing an early form of what we now think of as a, a journal article, right? Where you're meant to master um, the uh, literature that's out there around a question and uh, synthesize it and write something authoritative on the, on the subject. Uh, let's see. Okay. <clears throat> so with the introduction of Aristotle's works and of Greco-Arabic science in the late 12th and 13th centuries, the primacy of the traditional seven, seven liberal arts ceased and they became pathways or handmaidens to philosophy or more precisely, to natural philosophy. Um, of the seven liberal arts, logic played the most significant role in the new curriculum, largely because it was perceived as a tool of analysis applicable to all fields, a role that Aristotle himself assigned to it when, when he called his logical works the organon or instrument, right? Logic is our instrument, our tool for dealing with all kinds of things. Um, and then, ah, this is an important thing to introduce. Aristotle's philosophy, which came to be subdivided into three parts, known collectively as the three philosophies, natural philosophy, moral philosophy, and metaphysical philosophy. Um, economics, which I'm very interested in, is actually classically considered a part of moral philosophy. In fact, Adam Smith did not hold a chair in economics. He held a chair in moral philosophy. So that, you know, as late as the 17, middle 1700s, it's still being called moral philosophy. Um, and the natural philosophy, of course, is the what we now call the sciences, or the natural sciences, um, and metaphysical would be uh, theology and so forth. Um, this author claims that uh, the curriculum of medi medieval universities was essentially comprised of logic, the quadrivial subjects, math and so forth, and the three philosophies of which natural philosophy was clearly the most important. So, so he says that actually the medieval university was really focused on science above all. Um, you know, you, you had to learn logic to do science, right? But, but um, that was just a tool in terms of applying your learning. Uh, it was very often applied to science, natural philosophy. Um, and this is where the Whig theory that I mentioned, uh, where you see the problems with it because uh, things do go backwards. He mentions by the 16th century, the 1500s, knowledge of medieval logic with its complicated terminology had almost vanished. As humanism became more significant in the 15th and especially the 16th centuries, humanist authors attacked what they regarded as the sterility and barbarity of medieval logic. Uh, and I think we are now at the end of that road with the uh, clown world we live in. Um, we are mercifully free from the sterility of medieval logic and now can't tell the difference between a man and a woman anymore. Um, okay, let's see, what else do I wanna highlight here? Uh, geometry was the mainstay of the curriculum in the exact sciences. 
and Euclid's Elements, which was almost unknown during the early Middle Ages, was its fundamental text. Uh, let's see. Yeah, universe that was constituted of lines, angles, and figures could not be properly interpreted without geometry, nor indeed could the behavior of light, which like most physical effects was multiplied and disseminated in nature geometrically. So they saw geometry as very fundamental. Um, arithmetic was equally valued. Indeed, it was often ranked first among the mathematical sciences. Geometry and arithmetic were both valued because they were deemed essential for penetrating the operations of nature and for describing the variety of motions and actions in the world. Um, let's see. Okay, you're going to try to finish this up. Um, let's see. Many theologians regarded logic and natural philosophy as essential tools for the elucidation of theological problems. Um, and so, you know, that, that just helps you understand how they didn't see this, uh, you know, a, a pagan Aristotelian treatise on logic as irrelevant or a distraction. They saw it as feeding into things they were doing as, as in their theological thinking. Um, medieval scholars thought it important to know about the structure and operation of the universe, which was what an arts education was all about, master of arts, right? Um, and he says that the ideal of ancient and medieval learning to acquire knowledge for its own sake remained largely intact um, through the Middle Ages. Uh, so the arts programs at medieval universities, uh, he says, often failed to provide practical benefits to society, but they did construct firm foundations for the development of science and the scientific outlook. Um, and listen to this. This is an interesting testimony. This is from Ibn Khaldun, who lived from 1332 to 1406. And listen to his testimony about what's going on in Europe. We further hear now that the philosophical sciences are greatly cultivated in the land of Rome and along the adjacent northern shore of the country of the European Christians. They are said to be studied there again and to be taught in numerous classes. Existing systematic expositions of them are said to be comprehensive. The people who know them numerous and the students of them very many. So here he is, you know, by in the 1300s probably, uh, paying tribute to a network of learning in, in medieval Europe. Um, let's see. Right, and then finally he ends here with talking about the introduction of printing in the mid 15th century. Um, obviously, what you had prior to printing was handwritten copies, uh, the manuscript tradition, and there were, he details some challenges with that, right, inaccuracies in, in copying and so forth. Um, but with the advent of printed books, knowledge in general and technical information in particular could be disseminated with a speed and accuracy that could scarcely have been imagined in the age of manuscripts. Science was a particular beneficiary of printing. The printing press. Um, but um, the foundational contributions to early modern science that are its focus had already been formed long before Gutenberg's printing press converted Europe from a manuscript to a print culture. Despite the formidable, uh, formidable obstacles of manuscripts, the quality of the handwritten texts available to medieval scholars in science and natural philosophy was often more than adequate to allow for their comprehension and for the addition of significant contributions to learning. The core of that legacy was Aristotle's natural philosophy, which was deeply rooted in the medieval university. And that's where we'll take up next time with um, getting a taste. He goes pretty deep, and I don't, I don't want to go that deep when we get to it next time, uh, which will be in like three weeks. I'll explain in a moment. Um, uh, he goes pretty deep, but I do want to give you a little bit of a flavor of how Aristotle would come at things, his systematic way of um, thinking through a problem, which even when he was kind of getting the wrong end of the stick, it I, I think it, it gave the people who studied him a sort of a habit of mind of how to think through things in a very systematic and careful way. Um, and so they would use Aristotle's own approach to overturn some of Aristotle's conclusions, right, by, by using his approach and thinking more carefully through things. Um, okay, let's see. Um, uh, 
I don't think I see any comments to, to respond to, but let me just double check. January 7th. Okay, yeah, just gonna check uh, real quick, anything in the chat. Um, yep. Yeah, philosophy until the 20th century always included the knowledge and study of different sciences. Yeah, that that's something hopefully you've all just sort of picked up on it, but we now think of philosophy as, um, uh, I guess, certain aspects of moral philosophy and metaphysical, uh, you know, the mind-body problem and stuff like that, right? But, but traditionally, philosophy included natural philosophy, uh, what we now call science. So we kind of renamed it and split it out. Um, was that smart to uh, split these things out and have, you know, scientists who are kind of like technicians in a way and really cut off from the, um, not, you know, they, they're not really taught the uh, theological and the moral tradition of Europe? Eh, I, I think we have might have reason to regret um, hyper-specializing that, that much on these things, right? Something to think about as we continue to go through this. Um, Okay, so let me just explain what's coming next. Um, I will be, I will be at uh, the Mises Institute next weekend, and we'll be traveling on Thursday, so no show next week. Um, Ryan Turnipseed, frequent co-host, will be presenting or co-presenting. I think anyway, he's 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 doing. He's not just there as an observer. He's there as a participant. Hopefully we'll get a report on that afterwards. Um, what he did there, kind of fun to watch Ryan's ongoing progress. And uh, the, if you didn't see the last time with Ryan, um, please catch some exciting news there, uh, which we bury a little bit, but, um, it, it, you know, a little bit into the show, but uh, really exciting news about Ryan's um, career. And um, uh, so anyway, I'll be doing that next weekend. Then hopefully, if he's available, we'll do a Black Horse episode on uh, Econ Minis two weeks from today. And so that'll give me plenty of time to get further into this book and have it prepared for three weeks from today when I'll continue with um, the Foundations of Modern Science in the Middle Ages. I hope someone finds it interesting. All I can do is uh, share my enthusiasm for some of these topics and hope some other people... Uh, find it interesting or, or infected with, with my own interest in it. Um, it's, you know, one way of thinking about this sort of thing, learning about the Middle Ages, is that it's our history. And it's a history that was already being erased by people who felt hostility for various reasons to uh, the Middle Ages, maybe because they were Protestant or the Middle Ages were too Catholic, maybe because they were so-called humanists or, you know, essentially new atheist types, Redditors, you know, uh, Redditors of times past who, who um, wanted to smear the Middle Ages. Um, uh, yeah, good to hear, Dave, that you want to read the book. Um, uh, but for whatever reason, th there already was a lot of erasing of our history. And now I think we all can see that uh, the history of Europe and the European peoples They'd love to just blot it out, right? And replace it with lies. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't want to, you know, be too rah rah. I mean, obviously, any history of humans is going to have a lot of darkness in it. Um, but I think there's also plenty to be proud of in learning the history of, of uh, our European heritage. And there's, a reason I want to learn that history to bring it back in people's minds because I want to build on it just like the medievals built on uh, stood on the shoulders of giants right the ancient Greeks uh, I hope that once again we will stand on the shoulders of our um, European forebears right um, and we will not let these things be destroyed uh, but instead we will revive them. We will bring back the books. We'll save the books. We'll we'll bring them back, um, 
That's right. We cannot build a tradition that we do not know. That's right. We need to uh, stand on the shoulders of giants once again, which would include Aristotle, right? But also now um, the great medieval thinkers. Um, there's so much that we have, uh, what a wonderful heritage we have to preserve and to carry forward. And I personally am determined to do anything I can to see that happen and not let it just be destroyed by this current mania that we're in. Uh, anti-European, anti-white, whatever you want to call it, this mania that seems to want to just destroy everything wonderful that Europe did and just smear it all as a, a, you know, a big evil enterprise that, you know, it's best if we just uh, destroy whiteness or whatever, right? Which another way of saying that is erase the European heritage. Um, but I think that would be terrible and a tragedy, not just for Europeans, right? <laughs> because as we know, science uh, that developed in Western Europe, universities developed in Western Europe at their best, have been a blessing to people all around the world. Um, so, you know, yes, we fight for our own people, we fight for our own heritage, but I think we'll find that when we do that, um, we, we, we benefit others as well. And I, I see no reason to be ashamed of this heritage, uh, uh, you know, to, to treat it like crap. I think that's wrong, you know. Um, Okay, so that's everything for this week. Uh, once again, won't we'll see you until next time. Um, let me get one thing ready because what happened last time is the credits didn't roll and I had to wait awkwardly. So I'll just be awkwardly on the screen while I uh, pull that up. There we go. Get my um, credits thing up just in case I have to kick it to get it to go as I had to last time. Just a moment here, and I want to roll those credits and uh, thank all those people who support the show and work on the show as my producer and my graphic designer in there. Okay, where are the credits? Okay, if it doesn't work, I'll be able to kick it to make it work. Here we go. All right, thanks everyone. Anyone who got through this, you're my kind of people. <laughs>